Everybody gets knocked down. Some people just stay down. They decide that getting back up is not worth it to them, that the pain, the disappointment, the frustration is too much for them to take over and over again. So they just stay down, assuming at least things will be easier, even if they are disappointing. Other people seem to be able to get back up again. And it's not because things are actually easier for them. Getting back up is often painful and exhausting. It's just they've decided that where they are right this moment is not intended to be the defining moment of their lives, that there's a destiny that's greater than this, and they're going to do what they can to figure out what that is. That when you look at scripture, there's a lot of people who have stories that got knocked down. And uh, some of those stories have people who don't get back up again, and, and we read about their, their events in their lives. But some of them do get back up, and one of the more prominent get back up stories is a guy by the name of Joseph. If you don't know his story, he, he was, uh, had 11 brothers, and uh, uh, his brothers didn't like him very much. Uh, he was next to the youngest, and uh, his father, Jacob, uh, also known as Israel, uh, he liked Joseph better than all the other brothers, and Joseph was something of a tattletale. So he was constantly ratting his brothers out when they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And the father would give him gifts that they wouldn't give anybody else, and Joseph would talk like someday he was going to be in charge of everything, even though he was next to the youngest. And back in the family hierarchies of those days, that's not how it worked. And so they started having conversations with each other, brother to brother, about Joseph and what to do about him, and they decided what they would do is kill him. Now, how many think that that is not a good family to be a member of? You know, they actually just said they conspired to kill him, but when it came right down to the moment, they changed their mind. But what they decided to do was, was to make money off of him. There was no money in killing him, but if they sold him into slavery, they could get something for him that way. And they did that. And so he is purchased by a guy who lives in Egypt. His name is Potiphar. He's a, a, an influential and wealthy person. And Joseph is knocked down literally as a slave. And yet he finds his way to get up. He, he's a remarkable administrator and manager, and, and Potiphar keeps putting things in, in his life and in, in his sphere of influence to see how he handles them. And eventually, he's running the entire estate. He's just a very gifted guy. Now, Mrs. Potiphar, we don't know her name, so I'll call her Mrs. Potiphar, she had a thing for Joseph, and so she was constantly trying to seduce him, and he kept rejecting her advances. And finally, she decided that she was tired of being rejected, and she was going to get him out of the house. And so she accused him of rape, and the result was is that Joseph was arrested and thrown in prison. He's knocked down again. And yet, he finds his way up even from there. And all he does is just take responsibility for the things that are around him. And eventually, he's almost running the entire prison system. And it doesn't even stop there. By the time he's done, through a, a series of uh, circumstances I, I don't have time to go into today, he winds up being second only to the pharaoh of Egypt. That's his position. Just unbelievable capacity. And uh, so in that capacity, he's, he's got a lot of authority and a lot of power. And there's a great famine that comes through the region. It lasted for seven years. And because Joseph was such a, a, a remarkably gifted administrator, he had a plan for what to do in that. And not only did uh, Egypt survived that. They actually thrived in it. They had put away resources, and they had resources to sell, of course, at a markup value, and Egypt did very well. And one day, his brothers, who did not recognize him when they walked into the room, his brothers come because their region is also suffering famine. They need to buy food, and Egypt is the only grocery store in town. And so they go there. And so he starts asking them some very perceptive questions because he knows who they are. And he actually accuses them of possibly being a spy. Now, they still don't know who he is, but look at what the response is in Genesis 42. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen that's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, 
Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen? Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them again. It is an amazing thing how often this happens. They are going through trouble, these brothers. The pressure's on, and they're being accused of being spies. And they make, even though they don't recognize Joseph, they make a connection between the trouble they are in and the evil they have done. They are not the exception to the rule. That is the rule. People do this all the time. Something will be going wrong in their life and they will immediately connect the dots between something that's happening. Some cosmic justice is raining down on them and because I did this back then, then this is happening to me now. And what I want you to know is that's evidence that a person has not examined and repaired their past. They're just allowing themselves to, to continue to be victimized by things they have done or things that have been done to them. And the result is, is that they just wind up, every pressure point they experience in life feels like some kind of cosmic justice being meted out against them because they failed in some way. Or if you've been on the receiving end of that, you just assume that the pattern is repeating itself over and over again. Now, what's interesting is that Joseph was the one who had experienced all of this, but he has done work on dealing with his past. And so when he talks to his brothers, it sounds very different. Look at what it says in Genesis 50. When they find out it is Joseph, they're terrorized. Oh, he's going to be vengeful against us. We're, we're all dead. And this is Joseph's response. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And then he, what's the next word? Reassured them and spoke, next word, kindly to them. A person who has been knocked down and is able to reassure others and speak kindly to them is a person who has dealt with the issues of their past. If, if you're able to reassure and speak kindly to people, that shows you've done some work. But if it sounds more like Joseph's brothers, this is happening because, then that would indicate you've got some work to do. So our past basically consists in our memories. And how many have discovered that you remember some things that happened in your life pretty vividly, and then some things not so much, like where I left my keys? Um, I... The running joke in our house is I spend half my time looking for something I had in my hand five minutes ago. And that's just how that works. But in your memory, when you go back and you begin to analyze your life, you begin to recall some of those events that have taken place and the individuals who participated in them, you begin to realize how much of an influence that has been on your life. And here's the thing, too. Memories are not just like watching pictures or a video, memories actually have emotions attached to them. When you go back and you think about something, you will experience some of the emotion you experienced the first time that thing was happening. And so it's really risky to call up memories unless you have some skills to be able to manage that. And we are going to talk a little bit about that today. But a lot of our formation, a lot of things that, that we've come to learn about ourselves and our world, if we look back in our memories, we discover that that happened to us very early in our life. For example, just how you communicate with someone else. Maybe you were raised in a family where everything you said someone thought was intelligent or funny, and so they would listen to you a lot. And then maybe you were raised in a family where when you spoke, you got the, well, children are to be seen and not heard. Or in some families, children are not to be seen or heard. You know, just kind of like that. And so we learn different communication, not just vocabulary, but am I, do I have confidence in expressing my views or do I feel insecure and I withdraw when the opportunity comes to speak up? I can take you back to your childhood and find reasons why you respond the way you do today. That, that's in there. 
And it's, it's not just communication. Uh, our work ethic, a lot of that's learned when we are very young. Maybe someone set the bar really high for us, and that's what it's expected, and you've got to do that. And even though that person does, isn't even alive anymore, we're still trying to live up to that expectation. Or even more common is when somebody put us down, and they told us we'd never amount to anything, and we will work ourselves into an early grave just to prove them they are wrong. I had a person last Sunday when I they, walking out of the auditorium, they asked me if I was a type one personality. And I said, yes, I am. And they said, you know, type one people don't live as long. <laughs> and I said, we don't have to, we get our work done. <laughs> and all the laughing was by type one people. And everybody else is just going, yeah, that sounds so much like somebody I know. <laughs> Our work ethic, we, we're constantly trying to prove ourselves. And, and a lot of that comes from very early memories. Our basic view of God is often determined by things we were told or things that we experienced when we were very, very young. And our memories can become like a script, almost like programming code. And it starts controlling our actions and, and our, our words that we speak and, and the thoughts that we think. And what I will tell you is that's exactly how lots of people live their lives out. And if we don't learn to rewrite that code with the influence of faith and grace, we will wind up just repeating over and over again things that we didn't like at all about our lives. And so the Bible is full of stories of people who learn to rewrite that script in their lives with faith and with grace. So if you look on the back side of your paper, there's a, an ex exercise that I'm, I'm recommending that you do. And you can't do this in an afternoon or a day or even a week, probably not even in a month, but just something to do. And that is to go back and review some of your memories. Who are the people who have le had the greatest influence on you, whether it's good or bad? Kind of identify who they are, because some of us, it's a mystery to us until we start thinking about it. And then who, what ideas have you accepted as true that have guided your decisions, whether that's good or bad? That's a really important thing to do. And then thirdly, what significant events have changed you, good or bad? And, and here's the thing, when you go back and you start reviewing your life, it's amazing how often we think we don't remember that much of our early years until we start remembering something, and then that seems to unlock another memory and another memory. And what I will tell you is that all of this can be incredibly uh, painful and can be destructive unless we know how to respond to these issues, to these memories, to these emotions with the capacity of faith and grace. And so what I've discovered in scripture is that there are actually three main ways that people respond to dealing with their past and even repairing it. And the first is resilient people practice repentance. Resilient people practice repentance. They choose not to ignore or deny their past. If there's something there that needs to be addressed or corrected, they focus on it and they deal with it. Now, there's other options you can exercise. You can choose to try to completely walk away from your past. You just disengage from certain people or certain environments. You, you just get in your car or on your bike or whatever, and you just go. And you can do that. Uh, and the assumption is, is that if I go and leave the life of my past, that that's how I will get a new life. But what most people discover is all the things that, that you are think you're leaving behind you're actually dragging with you. And, and, and there's a lot of people who will seem a lot like the people you used to know. And you'll say things like, you're just like my, and then you fill in the blank. And that's a really unhealthy way to approach life. And then there are some people, they, they just accept the painful past of their lives to define them. This is all I'm good for. This is, this is just what happens to people like me. Other people have other options. I'm stuck where I am. They wind up allowing a lot of people to dump on them and take advantage of them because they don't think they're worth anything more than that. And both of those options wind up not being healthy. 
There is another option, and that's the option of repentance. And by the word, by the way, the word repentance was not originally a, a, a religious word. I don't know if you realize it. It actually was not a religious word to start. It was a navigation term. Back in the ancient world when you were traveling, they didn't have detailed maps or, or, or GPS devices like we have today. And so you'd be traveling along and, and you would go, well, by this time I should be you know, at a certain place or I should be able to see a landmark. And when you couldn't see it, you realized that the path that you were on was not the right path. And somehow you had uh, veered off. And so what you would do is you would go back, you would retrace your steps back to a place that was familiar to you, and then you would try a different direction. And that idea of, of, of returning back so that you get on the right path was the concept of repentance. Uh, what our GPS says is recalculating. Does, does anybody else's GPS say that to you besides me? Mine seems to say it a lot. In fact, one day I swear I heard her sigh. Just, just, <sighs> recalculating. So why do you have me turned on if you're not going to pay attention to me? This idea that I have to retrace and, and begin over again on a different path, this is what repentance actually is. It's the realization that the path I'm on is not the right path, that in, in some ways I'm actually lost. I don't know where I am, or I can't get where I need to go from where I am. And so we have to return back to something. And, and what the Bible says is we turn back to God. Now, re repentance means that you see the road that you're on differently. Maybe you think the road is fine, and then you realize this road is not taking me where I want to go. That, that little idea right there is a really important thing. Because that's the beginning of, of repentance. Or you see yourself differently, or you see others differently. Especially you see God differently. It's amazing how many people try to become Christians without changing their view of God. They saw him as overbearing, demeaning, demanding, destructive, and, and, and they come into religious environments and they still see him that way. They just try to be more compliant so they get less of his wrath. And that's not repentance. You have to learn to see God differently. We aim our lives towards him. Without repentance, the only thing left for you to do is to rationalize your choices and blame others. And here's what you should know. No one gets to the future they want with rationalization and blame. In fact, you can't change anything using those two options. It guarantees you stay stuck exactly where you are. When you're rationalizing and you're blaming, you have no options you're just, you're explaining to someone why you are. And repentance does something very, very different. It, it helps you look at your past truthfully. Repentance helps us see ourselves differently. And when we do that, it actually is it, it unlocks some truths about ourselves. And sometimes that's encouraging, sometimes it's not so encouraging. You know, when you start really examining yourself, you'll see some things that are good you didn't realize, and then you'll see some things that are not so good. And maybe you did realize or you think they're a lot worse than, than they actually are. Uh, this, this doesn't happen to anybody in this service, but the other services. This happens to them. Yeah, <laughs> but not, not you guys. Uh, but somebody will say, why, why, do I, why do I keep winding up in a relationship where, and then they're taken advantage of or they're not respected or people are dishonest with them or whatever. They, they just fill in the mind. Why does that keep happening to me? And... What I will tell you is repentance will stop focusing on them and start focusing on you. Why are you attracted to people who tend to take advantage of you? Why do you let them have access to your life? That's a really, really painful thought to work your way through. But repentance doesn't let you off the hook. Repentance will force you to deal with the truth about yourself because it is in dealing with the truth about yourself that you have options to exercise. If it's always someone else's fault, then you're never going to change. Something has to change inside of you. So a lot of people also think that repentance is just feeling bad. If you feel bad that somehow you have repented, 
Can I suggest to you that there are lots of people who feel very bad about things that they have done and things that they have said, but nothing really changes in their life. In fact, I have met people who feel very bad about things and they do over and over again those very same things. In, anyone caught in the cycle of addiction, it's certainly not limited to that, but anyone caught in the cycle of addiction, they feel incredible regret, and yet that doesn't seem to get them out. We, we've turned um, religion into, you're supposed to feel super bad about something. Regret ties you to your past and gives you no future. Repentance is what releases you from your past and gives you a different future. It is recognizing what is true. It is seeing the road you're on yourself and God very differently. And as a result, now you're going to make some different choices. That's what repentance is. Somebody says, well, I don't know if I can trust them. They, they didn't seem to feel bad enough about what it was that they had done. Well, trust is earned and that should take time. But to me, I'm, I'm not counting the number of tears. I'm looking at the actions they're taking. Does that make sense to anybody? So repentance. Regret is not the same as repentance. So resilient people practice repentance. Resilient people practice forgiveness. Forgiveness. Uh, when you review your life, you're going to have to deal with the harsh truth that there are some people who hurt you, and they hurt you deeply. But if you hold on to unforgiveness, you won't be able to move into your future. Unforgiveness is exactly what ties you to your past. Now, a lot of people misdefine forgiveness. And I wish I could tell you that religious environments do a better job of, of this, but uh, as a rule, uh, we, we don't do that much better either. And so you'll, you'll hear statements like, well, if you forgive, you forget. May I suggest to you that dementia is not the same thing as forgiveness? <laughs> it's not. I would like to suggest to you that you don't have to forget in order to forgive. Forgiveness just simply means I will not hurt you back for what you did to me. It's the decision that I will not try to add pain to your life because of the pain that you added to my life. That's a very important decision that we, are, that we can make but forgiveness requires you to realize that, that, that you're not going to hurt them back. And it helps you realize something else. That under the right circumstances, you could have done the same thing or maybe even worse. And this is really intriguing about uh, forgiveness because forgiveness humbles us. You know, here's the dirty secret about unforgiveness. When we don't forgive someone, we always feel superior to them. Well, they did that to me. I would never do that to them. Or I would never do that, period. So I'm, I'm going to tell you something you might not like to hear today. If the thought in your head is, I'm not the kind of person that would do something like that, you should know you are exactly the kind of person who will do something like that. That's who does that stuff. It is the humility of recognizing that I am capable of doing unbelievably, unexplicably painful and destructive things, and therefore I need the influence of faith and grace in my life, or I will head in directions that will destroy me and destroy the people that I love in my life. And so forgiveness is very humbling, and forgiveness is not a single decision. I wish I could just decide to forgive somebody, and then it would be all done. Wouldn't that be great? Has this ever happened to you? I chose to forgive someone. I even told God I was forgiving them. God, I choose to forgive that person. And then I'm driving down the road in the car, and I'm having an imaginary conversation where I'm giving that person my two cents. <laughs> and as soon as I catch myself doing that, I'll just go, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. Sorry, God. <laughs> I choose not to have a conversation like that with them. And if that wound is fresh, you might have that experience many times in a day. But over the course of time, if you keep choosing to forgive them, you actually have that experience less often. And I can honestly say this, this has happened to me. 
There are things that I have chosen to forgive people for, and if they were to bring it up, I would have trouble remembering what it was. And it's because I'm not tied to it. I've let that go. Resilient people practice forgiveness. It's not a single decision. It's a process. By the way, when Jesus, the Son of God, is being crucified and taking the punishment on him for all the sins of the world, he does something very interesting from the cross. By the way, crucifixion was, was probably the single most painful way of, of execution ever devised by any group of humans in any culture, in any generation. It was unbelievably painful. And Jesus, while he's being crucified, actually cries out to his father and says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Why is Jesus doing that? Because if Jesus cannot exercise forgiveness, then resentment and bitterness will enter him. Forgiveness is the only thing that keeps evil out of your heart. And it is not possible for Jesus to remain sinless if he lets bitterness and resentment in. Jesus had to forgive them so he was able to forgive us. And if we don't understand that, we will wind up perpetuating our unforgiveness for generations to come. It's an unhealthy way to live. So resilient people practice forgiveness and resilient people practice gratitude. As difficult as our past may have been, there are still things that we can be grateful for. There are people who maybe they showed patience to us or kindness to us or supported us in some way. There are blessings that God has released into our lives. Gratitude doesn't require you to deny that you've been through painful things. Gratitude just says that's not the only thing that has happened to you, that there are some good things that have happened too. Gratitude simply says, there are things that I could acknowledge that have been beneficial to me. They've happened in my life. Good things that have happened, and there are people who help make that happen. And gratitude actually names what happened and who was responsible for it and expresses appreciation. Gratitude is the only antidote I know to entitlement. Entitlement just basically says, what I get, I have earned. And the problem with that is that you, it's very easy for any of us to assume that everything we have, we've worked for and we've earned. But there are lots of things that we have not earned at all. Benefits and blessings that have come into our lives. And if we think we have earned everything, then we will feel entitled. And when someone does do something nice for us, we'll just assume we earned that too. Gratitude is recognizing that grace has occurred. There is something that I benefited from that I didn't earn, that I didn't cause to have happen, but I was able to receive in my life. That's what grace is. I didn't cause it. I didn't earn it, but I benefited from it. And here's what's astonishing is our world is actually filled full of grace, but so many of us are so blind to it. Good things come into our lives and we don't even recognize them. And so resilient people practice gratitude. Gratitude realizes that I can't do life on my own. I, my abilities and my resources are not enough. I need assistance from God and from others. And as soon as you cross that bridge, then you can start being grateful for the things that God brings into your life. Gratitude is how you actually assign value to something. When you say thank you for something or to someone, you're actually elevating the value of that thing and that individual in your life. Now, I'm not much of an artist. God knows I can't draw anything. Uh, I've, I have no artistic capacity at all in terms of drawing. And nothing I would ever attempt to draw would make its way anywhere, nor should it. But I, I have been in museums where there are works of art that are considered uh, just remarkable pieces of art, and they're considered invaluable. Now, I have to admit that I can't always tell the difference. Because <laughs> I've seen some works of art, and I've looked at them and go, you're kidding, right? <laughs> That's worth how much? It's worth whatever someone is willing to pay for it. That's what it's worth. When we express gratitude, we're elevating the value 
of what was done. We're recognizing that that was important to us. We're telling people that mattered. We're telling people they matter. We elevate that value. It's a very powerful thing that gratitude can do. So gratitude assigns value. Now, when you practice repentance, forgiveness, and gratitude, when you practice these resilient principles, you get wisdom. You get wisdom. You begin to notice other options that you didn't see before in your life. You begin to see how this thing influenced that outcome. You begin to notice and understand principles that can actually lead to a healthier and happier life. It helps you to see how you got where you are and how to get where you are going. When we practice repentance and we practice forgiveness and we practice gratitude, we start gaining wisdom. You actually see life with a different perspective. You see how God has been at work in each and every day. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, it's a, it's a challenging thing to review our lives and assume that there's stuff we have to correct or address. And so I'm just asking that you will help each and every one of us in this room to realize that repentance is a healthy thing for all of us. That there are things that we can see differently and we can retrace steps and retrace our steps and get on a different path and, and you will help us do that. For some of us in this room, maybe we've held on to an unforgiveness and we're waiting for the other person to apologize or make things right and and we're trapped. Uh, we're knocked down and we're not getting up. Would you help us whisper a prayer today to you that just as I choose to forgive that person so that those chains can break free from us and we can start moving into the future you've called for us. Can you help us express thanksgiving, appreciation for all the amazing things and people you brought into our lives? That when we do these things, life makes more sense and we experience more of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.